Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Department of Internal Medicine Medical Grand Rounds. Uh, I am Christian Bergman, I'm the host, and welcome back. Uh, this is the first uh, virtual uh, and uh, in-person conference uh, that we have had, and first in-person gathering for the department in two years now for Grand Rounds. So uh, excited. Uh, just for folks that are online and uh, here in person, we have about 15, 16 people in person, and we have 45 people online. So there's a mix uh, of attendees. So bear with us while we work through this hybrid approach. Please use the chat box if you have any comments during the session. I'll be monitoring that if there are any technical difficulties. Um, just want to remind folks about the uh, grand round. So it will be in-person and hybrid for this uh, academic year, 2022 and 2023. It is every Thursday from 12 to one o'clock, except for Thanksgiving and except for two weeks around Christmas, following Christmas. Uh, stay tuned with further emails and updates. Uh, we are in person here at the George Ben Johnston Auditorium, uh, which is next to the Medical Education Building. Uh, you can also get it to it from Sanger Hall if you exit towards the back and walk across the street. Uh, our speakers for this season will be a mix of virtual and in-person, so I would just pay attention to the communications, um, and we're hoping to help facilitate some networking here uh, on the in-person sessions, uh, either before or right after. I'm gonna put a couple of links in the chat uh, for those here in person, the links are at the top. There's an option to add all future uh, department internal medicine grand route events to your calendar. There's a QR code you can scan. Um, also, um, there's an opportunity to provide feedback. Uh, we would like to hear how things go throughout the fall semester. And so there's a QR code for that as well. It's a quick, just any feedback comments uh, that you have. So uh, please go ahead and um, let us know if you have any issues. A couple of housekeeping issues real quick. Um, if you are uh, virtually, please make sure you are muted. Um, if you're in person, please mute your cell phones during uh, the duration. If you need to step out, um, please do so, that's fine. Um, we will facilitate a Q&A session at the end of each grand rounds, and we'll work with a combination of in-person and virtual. So if you are virtual, it would be the same as last year. Please use the chat or the Q&A function, and we will take your calls and uh, facilitate a discussion with our speakers. The session is recorded, will be posted on the website within one to two weeks, and you will get CE credits. Uh, the credit code is on the screen. Um, and we will put that in the chat box once we get started here in a minute also. Um, today, the, today's session is sponsored by the department. This is our first, and we have some uh, outside speakers that we would like to invite, as well as panelists from our Infectious Disease Division. Um, so just want to um, introduce folks. So today's session uh, is titled Monkeypox, a clinical and epidemiology update and panel discussion. Uh, our speakers are uh, Dr. Brandy Darby uh, from Virginia Department of Health, Dr. Alexis Page, also from the Virginia Department of Health. We have Dr. Kira Shishido uh, here from VCU Defection of, Division of Infectious Diseases, Dr. Patricia Falco, also from the School of Pharmacy, and Dr. Gonzalo Behrman. Let me introduce our speakers. Uh, we will start with introducing our uh, speakers from the Virginia Department of Health, uh, who will present uh, first, and then I will introduce our panelists and bring them up about halfway through our presentation here. So let me start. Um, I will introduce Dr. Brandy Darby. Uh, Dr. Darby graduated from uh, as, as a doctor of veterinary medicine from Louisiana State University in 2007 and as a Master of Public Health from Michigan State University in 2016. She's board certified in veterinary preventative medicine and has experience working in clinical practice and veterinary academia. In 2019, she joined the Virginia Department of Health as a veterinary epidemiologist in the Division of Surveillance and Investigation. Thank you, Dr. Darby. Dr. Alex Alexis Page earned her Doctorate of Pharmacy from Ohio State University and subsequently went on to complete a PGY-1 community-based pharmacy residency program and community-based pharmacy leadership and management fellowship in collaboration with VCU and Kroger Health. 
She now serves as the Deputy Director of the Division of Pharmacy Services within the Virginia Department of Health, where she manages COVID-19 and monkeypox response units. Welcome, Dr. Page. We are glad that you all are able to join us today. I'm going to stop my share and uh, allow you all to uh, bring up your screen. Thank you. All right. Thank you all. I'm going to kick us off. Um, my name is Brandy Darby. If we can go to the next slide. Today, we'll be covering with you an overview of monkeypox and how you can work together with public health to better identify cases um, and then manage those cases. We'll be talking about our vaccination and medication strategies, as well as tools that we've developed for healthcare facilities. Monkeypox uh, is a disease caused by infection with the monkeypox virus. It's part of the same family of viruses as smallpox. And there are two distinct clades that exist. Clade one is associated with more severe illness. Thankfully, clade two is the one that's associated with the current global outbreak. Monkeypox symptoms are similar to smallpox, but tend to be milder. And monkeypox is rarely fatal. I have case numbers there from the end of last week where we were seeing more than 53,000 cases globally from 100 different countries, more than 19,000 cases across the US and um, 353 cases in Virginia. I did check today's case numbers. Today we have 392 reported cases here in Virginia. Next slide. Epidemiology and transmission, this has been really different than what we've seen previously with monkeypox. There was a recent CDC MMWR that was published that looked at cases of transmission from early in the global outbreak. The majority of cases have been occurring in men who have sex with men. In the data poll for the MMWR, 99% of US cases had occurred in men and of those, 94% reported intimate sexual contact with other men. And notably, 41% of these cases had HIV infection. So that was still, that was true early in the outbreak. Um, that continues to be the main trend that we are seeing. I will say that we've slowly seen an increase in our female patients over time. Uh, and our partners in Maryland are seeing about 5% of their cases as female now. So it's important to recognize that while diseases might start in one population, they don't necessarily stay there. When we're thinking about the person-to-person -person transmission that can happen in several different ways, uh, we believe the most efficient is through direct contact with infectious rash, scab um, lesions, or body fluids. We can also see transmission through large respiratory droplets during prolonged face-to-face -face contact or during intimate contact. And then we can also see transmission through fomites or touching contaminated items such as bed linens or clothing, although we do believe that this is a much less common route of transmission, much less effective route of transmission than um, the direct contact. People can also spread the fetus to, pregnant people can spread the infection from the, themselves to the fetus through the placenta as well. And it's also worth noting that, you know, we're not seeing as much of this with the current outbreak, but in areas where monkeypox is known to be endemic, we also see transmission from people who have had contact with infected animals. We don't totally understand the animal reservoir completely in Africa. We believe it's associated with small rodents and uh, non-human primates. And so people who have been scratched or bitten by these animals who are preparing uh, food from infected animals or using products from these animals um, can be at risk of exposure. Next slide. Next slide. So these are pictures. Um, I think we skipped one, maybe. There, there we go. Okay. Um, so with the transmission dynamics, um, 
people generally are going to be infectious while they are while they are symptomatic. And so um, that is going to be from the time symptoms begin until all of their rash lesions have completely healed and there is a new layer of intact epithelium that's formed underneath. And that illness can is typically going to last between two to four weeks. The incubation period we found is a little bit shorter than we previously thought it was. Um, that can be between normally between about three to 17 days. It can be as high as 21 days. That's why we will do 21 days of monitoring for those who are identified as contacts of cases. The lesions are um, typically quite firm, rubbery, well circumscribed, deep seated, and often develop umbilication, which can look like a little dot um, at the top on the center of that lesion. Lesions are also in this outbreak appearing a little bit differently than we've seen them previously. They will typically begin in the genital, the anorectal, or the oral areas. Um, the rash will not always disseminate over the body as we've seen with some of these more classic monkeypox cases. It really can be just a handful of lesions and sometimes even just a single lesion that are present. An important part of the clinical history is that these lesions are gonna often be described as quite painful. Uh, until they enter into that healing phase when they'll become a little bit more itchy. Um, and so some of these patients have had to be hospitalized mainly for pain management associated with lesions. With classical monkeypox presentation, we'll see a fever and other prodromal symptoms preceding the development of the rash. With this particular outbreak, uh, you may or may not see that prodrome or the prodrome might occur um, at the same time that the rash appears. All other clinical signs that you might see include purulent or bloody stools, rectal pain, rectal bleeding, as well as respiratory symptoms such as sore throat and congestion. Next slide. Okay, so here are pictures of the various monkeypox lesions. Some of these are kind of um, over towards the right hand side are, are the more classic lesions that, and so you can see very well circumscribed. Um, in some of those images, you can see the central umbilication. Um, and then as we go towards the middle and the left, these are some of the lesions that we've seen with the current monkeypox outbreak. And so you can see that they can really mimic and look like just about anything. Um, some of these can look like folliculitis, they can look like an ingrown hair. And so I think it's really important that if you see patients presenting with a new rash illness, to just think of possibility of monkeypox. Um, clinical testing is readily available. And so if you have any thoughts or concerns that monkeypox could be um, a potential, then we would encourage you to, to test, have a, have a low threshold for testing. Next slide. So several commercial labs are now offering monkeypox testing, including LabCorp, Quest, Aegeus, Sonic Healthcare, and some Mayo Clinics. For more detailed information about what each of those labs requires, uh, we encourage you to check their websites. Uh, we do recognize that testing through commercial labs is not free. And so we continue to offer testing through our state public health laboratory. And so if you think you have a patient who meets the clinical and epidemiologic criteria for testing through DCLS, please reach out to your local health department who can talk through those criteria with you, see if the patient qualifies and then help to facilitate testing. And then we're encouraging all providers, regardless of where testing occurs, to reach out and reach out early um, to the local health department about patients you're testing. That way it's on our radar and we can work with you in a pretty timely way to develop a line list of exposed persons and go through the contact tracing process. Next slide. Okay, some messages about general infection prevention and control. It's really important that we communicate with both our employees and patients when it comes to the risk of monkeypox. We know that anyone can get and spread the monkeypox virus. It's not confined to just one population. Uh, so it's important that everyone is educated about the symptoms and behaviors that can lead to the spread of monkeypox. Certainly we know that certain behaviors, including high-risk sexual behaviors, can put people at greater risk. 
And we know that activities that involve close prolonged contact, including sexual contact, particularly with many partners or anonymous partners, um, is going to increase that risk. And we also want to be forward thinking and combat any stigma by just providing some fact-based information to everyone and emphasizing that this is um, something that can happen to really any person. Next slide. So when patients come into the clinic, it's really important that we want to triage why they're there. Um, they might not necessarily mention this as a complaint when they make the appointment to come in. Um, so much in the same way that we've gotten accustomed to asking screening questions for COVID-19, it's important to be thinking about monkeypox in the healthcare setting so that we can quickly triage those with a concern for monkeypox into a separate room where they're isolated uh, and medically evaluated without sitting in the waiting room for a long period of time. And also so that those who are taking vitals on intake can use appropriate PPE and precautions to minimize, minimize their risk of exposure. When we isolate these patients, when they come in, we wanna bring them into a single room where they have their own dedicated bathroom. And we wanna limit patient transport throughout the facility. When that needs to happen, we wanna make sure that the person is wearing a well-fitting mask and that they cover all of their lesions, whether that's with long sleeve clothing or a bed sheet um, during transport. We want to make sure that we're using both standard and transmission-based precautions. This includes using gown, gloves, N95 respirator and eye protection. Any procedures that are likely to spread oral secretions and aerosolize them should be performed in an airborne infection isolation room. And we wanna avoid activities that might spread material from the lesions. So for example, if we're cleaning up soiled um, linens or laundry from the room, we want to make sure that we're pretty um, containing that. Um, so, so just bagging up those linens, uh, avoid doing anything that might shake or aerosolize virus into the room from contaminated materials. Next slide. Routine environmental cleaning and disinfection remains important. Just make sure that the environmental cleaning product that you're using has an EPA label for emerging viral pathogens and wet cleaning methods are preferred. So we want to avoid dry dusting, sweeping or vacuuming again that could aerosolize virus. When conducting patient testing, make sure that you're using um, CDC infection prevention and control guidance. There's a link to that here on the slide, but generally that's gonna include all of the precautions we talked about, eye protection and 95 gowns and gloves. And then when it comes to medical waste management, um, generally for most monkeypox patients, they're going to have clade two exposures. And so that waste can be managed as regulated medical waste and you can go through your normal processes. However, um, you might have a person who presents to you who could be at risk for clade one exposure. And mainly what we're concerned about here is a history to travel to certain parts of Africa in the previous 21 days. And so um, for those patients with that travel history who might have clade one exposure, we need to hold on to medical waste and that needs to be managed as category A waste um, until we have that clade confirmation back. Next slide. Okay, I'm gonna hand over to Dr. Page. Thanks, Dr. Darby. Um, so what I'll talk about now are a couple of vaccination and medication strategies we have to combat this public health outbreak. Um, so first we'll start off with vaccination strategies. Uh, so right now we have two vaccinations available through the strategic national stockpile. Um, the first one is uh, a vaccine called Geneos. So Geneos is actually FDA approved for um, the treatment and for the prevention of smallpox and monkeypox for those ages 18 years and older. Um, it was recently authorized for um, through an emergency use, use authorization to be used for those under the age of 18, and then also to change the route of administration from subcutaneous to intradermal. So we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, so the first vaccine we have available is Geneos. Um, and this is what we are currently receiving from the strategic national stockpile. 
The other vaccine that's available, but VDH hasn't ordered or drawn down quite yet, is something called AKM2000. So AKM2000 is a live vaccine versus Janaeus, which is a, an attenuated live virus. So there's a little bit more risk when it comes to AKM2000. Um, and again, which is one of the reasons why we haven't drawn it down yet from the SNS. Um, but this is another resource that we have access to. Um, the caveat here is that it's not FDA approved um, for the prevention of monkeypox. It's through an expanded access investigational new drug protocol, which is again, another reason why we haven't um, leveraged this resource quite yet. So for the purposes of this conversation, we'll be talking heavily, uh, primarily about Geneos. So, out of these two vaccines, like I've said, we have access to Geneos, and this is a two-dose series, um, so it can be administered subcutaneously, which is what is FDA approved for, or intradermally. Um, the doses are separated by 28 days, um, and the preferred route is intradermal. The reason for this is um, we don't have a, we don't have a large quantity of Geneos available through the strategic national stockpile. So the EUA that authorized Geneos to be used intradermally is uh, one of the reasons is to try to extend the, the number of doses that we have through the subcutaneous route. So one subcutaneous dose of Geneos is 0 0.5 mLs. The intradermal dose is 0 0.1 mLs. So in theory, we have access to many more doses um, by administering it through the intradermal route. Um, when we administer this vaccine intradermally, we expect a wheel or some sort of, um, uh, I guess, bump on your arm to annotate that the medication or the vaccine is being absorbed into the into the skin. Um, we are training our vaccinators right now um, to be more equipped with intradermal administrations, um, and at this time, it's it's not required or not recommended that we vaccinate. Um, those healthcare workers that are administering uh, Geneos. We'll talk about some of the indications for eligibility in just a couple of slides. Um, but the big takeaways here is that Geneos is a two-dose series. Um, it, there are certain contraindications um, specific to if they have if the recipient has an, a severe allergic reaction to another or previous Geneos dose or has a severe allergic reaction to gentamicin, ciprofloxacin, or an egg protein. AKM2000, on the other hand, it's a one-dose series, but when a patient receives an AKM2000 administration, they're not considered fully vaccinated until 28 days after the first dose administration. Um, for, the, for the sake of time, we will skip um, talking about AKM2000, but we will uh, share these slides with Dr. Bergman for him to disseminate out. Um, so next, I believe we will... Eventually, we'll talk about the eligibility criteria. But again, this is um, a little bit more about the EUA for Geneos with regards to subcutaneous or intradermal dosing. So for patients who are 18 years and older, it's preferred to receive an intradermal dose of the Geneos vaccine, and that's 0.1 mLs. And again, it's a two-dose series with the second dose repeated in 28 days. For those that are actually under the age of 18, the preferred route of administration is subcutaneous. And so that would be a 0.5 mL administration, again, with the second dose being 28 days later. So there's a little bit of nuance um, here. We're training our vaccinators to understand when um, to administer ID versus subcutaneous, um, but intradermal is preferred if for those that are over the age of 18. For after too many intradermal attempts, or I guess after two intradermal attempts, and if a wheel is not produced or if um, there's visible leakage, then it's recommended to administer for a full subcutaneous dose um, uh, if the intradermal doses are invalid. So here we'll talk a little bit about the priority groupings for those that are eligible to receive the monkeypox vi uh, vaccine. So again, we don't have a large supply from the strategic national stockpile, so we need to prioritize our high-risk groups first um, to receive the vaccine. So the first priority group would be those that have had um, or those that are qualified for post-exposure prophylaxis. So, you know, the traditional um, you've had a known exposure um, and we will administer the vaccine to prevent um, uh, disease progression or contracting the, the monkeypox virus. Um, the CDC recommends that the vaccine be administered as soon as possible after that known exposure. Um, so anybody that has a known exposure is eligible to receive um, the monkeypox vaccine. The second category that's a little bit uh, different is something called expanded post-exposure prophylaxis or expanded PEP. So this is meant to um, try to 
cast a wider net and um, administer the vaccine to those that may have had potential exposures. So patients that would fall into this category would be those that have multiple sexual partners, um, but they don't have a confirmed or a, a, a definitive known exposure. Um, so again, this is meant to just uh, try to get a little bit more um, post-exposure prophylaxis administrations out there, even if a patient doesn't have a confirmed exposure. And then the last um, priority group would be the pre-exposure prophylaxis group. So again, most patients are not um, eligible to receive Geneos um, or a monkeypox vaccine as a pre-exposure prophylaxis. Um, we're really trying to priority, prioritize those that have had known exposures. There's conversations ongoing at the, the Virginia Department of Health about expanding access, um, eligibility to include pre-exposure prophylaxis, um, but we're really trying to um, prioritize those that have um, sex with multiple sex, par sex partners, um, those that may be at high risk due to occupational exposures, like those that work in um, bathhouses, uh, strip clubs or anywhere where sexual activity may occur um, because that may have caused um, one of those patients to have had an, an, uh, an exposure previously. So at VDH, again, these are our priority groups. It's not routinely recommended to be administered to the general public. Again, we are just using our priority groups to vaccinate those specific um, patient populations that would have high risk. Um, and again, we will be expanding to post pre-exposure prophylaxis soon, as soon as we can ensure that our post-exposure prophylaxis and our expanded post-exposure prophylaxis um, needs have been met. So again, with traditional post-exposure prophylaxis, um, the goal is to vaccinate people that have had a known exposure. Um, so this is really, the goal here is to prevent illness or minimize severity of that illness if they do contract the disease. Um, the LHDs or the local health departments are doing case investigations um, for those that have had known exposures. And again, it is recommended to give the vaccine as soon as possible after that known exposure, but it can be given um, within, um, within 14 days of that known exposure. Again, if somebody does have a known exposure, it's important that they do um, some other self-isolation or preventive measures um, to reduce the spread to other individuals. For expanded PEP, um, again, here are a couple of examples of who would fall into this expanded PEP category. Um, so that would be those that are aware of one of their sexual partners having been diagnosed with uh, monkeypox in the past two weeks, or those that have sex with multiple sex partners, um, and one of those partners has a confirmed case. Um, some other groups that are recommended that VDH is recommending um, be included into this group would be those of any orientation, um, having multiple sex partners, sex workers, or those that are working um, where sexual activity may occur. And then again, pre-exposure prophylaxis. We're not um, administering this at this time for all healthcare workers. Um, some lab, uh, laboratorians or uh, lab workers may be eligible for um, pre-exposure pre prophylaxis, and that may be due to um, those uh, lab workers handling monkeypox samples or monkeypox um, swabs. So, you know, work with your local health district if you're interested in receiving a vaccination for PrEP, but at this time we're really reserving doses for those that have been exposed or may have been exposed. For VCU in particular, if you're interested in receiving the vaccine um, and want to um, you know, administer the vaccine to eligible patient populations, um, just work with your local health district um, to procure that vaccine. We are um, in the process of uh, discussing opening up vaccine ordering to other uh, external providers um, in the hopes of reaching additional patients. So work with your local health district if um, you're interested in you know, taking on uh, administering some of the vaccine. So with that, I'm going to jump into the treatment strategies. Um, we do have a couple of um, tools in our toolkit specific to monkeypox treatment. But before I jump into the drugs themselves, um, it is important to note that not every single patient that's diagnosed with monkeypox will require treatment. Um, it's estimated about 20% of all cases requires or um, needs to be treated with monkeypox. And those that should be considered for treatment would would include those that have severe disease. So um, patients that may be hospitalized with monkeypox, either due to pain or some other type of um, comorbidity like um, hemorrhagic disease, confluent lesions, things like that. So severe disease treatment should be considered. 
those that are at high risk of severe disease progression, including those that are immunocompromised, um, pregnant or breastfeeding women, patients under the age of eight years old, um, those patients should be considered for treatment just because, again, they are high risk of progressing to severe disease. And then those that have lesions in those sensitive areas like the eyes, mouth, um, genitals, or anal rectal area um, should be considered for treatment as well. None of the treatments that we have in our toolkit specifically like our narcotics or treat pain management, but TPOX, the one medication that we have access to, does alleviate some of the pain affiliated with monkeypox lesions. So it's important just to consider um, patients that are that are experiencing severe pain from monkeypox lesions, um, just to consider them for treatment. So I'll go through over some of these quickly. Again, the primary treatment that we have in our toolkit is uh, tecoviramat or TPOX. So this is a medication. Um, that is through the strategic national stockpile. And it's um, it's an investigational new drug um, and it's been approved for expanded access through the CDC. So the CDC has authorized their IRB to open up the protocol for tecoviramat and use it um, across the country for patients that may be suffering from monkeypox illness. So this is a weight-based dosing um, medication and so if you read the, the EA IND protocol, um, it will go over the dosing information there. There are a couple other drugs that are available. Sidofavir is commercially available. Um, there's not a lot of data related to um, the treatment of monkeypox, but it, this is a medication that may be used for uh, monkeypox disease management. Um, VIGIV is an, uh, 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 an immune globulin um, that's available through the strategic national stockpile. Um, if this was a medication that was required to treat a patient, we would have to work with the CDC for approval before we initiate it. And then brin sidofavir, um, this is another medication that's through the strategic national stockpile, but the CDC is currently developing a protocol for this uh, drug's use. So again, the, the true drug that we have available is TPOX. Um, and you can get that through the Department of Health. Um, I know VCU already has some on hand, which is great. Um, but if you're interested in trying out Sidofavir, that's another drug that you could order commercially as well. Um, it's probably no surprise to you guys, but TPOX um, treatment does require um, a little bit of administrative paperwork to initiate treatment. So because TPOX is an investigational new drug and it's authorized through a specific CDC protocol, um, prescribers have to comply with some of this documentation um, for um, initiating TPOX uh, treatment. So because this is a clinical trial that patients are enrolling in, the patient needs to have informed consent documented, um, which uh, we have all the links to all the documents here, um, but informed consent is really important. And then the patient intake form is um, also required. And then these two forms need to be emailed to the CDC directly. Um, and this can happen before or after treatment is initiated. I recommend doing it before treatment is initiated just because you don't wanna start treatment and then have the patient decline um, being enrolled in a, in a clinical trial. The other um, important documentations that are required is an FDA form 1572. So this form um, is completed once per facility. It's not per patient. Um, VCU has already completed this form, so I won't go over it. Um, but then additionally, providers are required to um, submit any um, serious adverse events to um, the FDA through the serious adverse events form um, for any patients that are started on TPOX. And there are some op optional documentation forms as well, um, which um, you can review um, after. So again, right now, VDH is the only distributor of TPOX in Virginia. We are encouraging health systems to have some on hand as pre-positioned inventory to expedite time to treatment for those patients that need it. Um, and I know VCU has some on hand, which is great. Um, Providers that are interested in starting TPOX can, you know, dip into VCU's allocation, or you can complete this TPOX provider treatment initiation interest form. So it's a bit of a mouthful, but essentially what that means is um, you can request VDH to directly dispense the drug, and we can ship it to the patient, we can ship it to the provider's office, or we can just ship undispensed TPOX or, you know, TPOX in bottles, ship it to the provider's office, and the provider can dispense it. Um, so we hope that with VDH dispensing the drugs, that that's taking a little bit of the administrative workload off the provider. Um, however, because TPOX is through a CDC program, we don't have the ability to modify some of the documentation required to, to initiate TPOX. Um, for all 
providers that are initiating TPOX, we do request that this um, patient initiation survey be completed. That way we have some visibility into the number of patients receiving TPOX in the Commonwealth. Um, and then again, we do encourage that um, health systems, local health districts, and local infectious disease providers have inventory on hand that's pre-positioned um, to expedite time to treatment. So I am going to hand it back over to Dr. Darby to talk about tools and resources for healthcare facilities. Thanks. Just quickly for everyone, just wanted to make sure that you're aware of these things that we have available for you. The first is a preparedness checklist that can be used to um, just think through procedures for when patients come in and we're handling them and, and what the processes are within a facility. Um, make sure that we're ready for potential monkeypox cases. Next slide. Sorry, next slide. We also have a risk assessment tool that can be used to assess potential exposures. So, you know, with these exposures, we can have high risk exposures, we can have intermediate risk exposures, or we can have those that have either low or uncertain or no risk. And so um, this tool is just a, a little questionnaire that you can go through to assess contact risk. Um, vaccination might be offered to those with um, high risk exposures. And then uh, if we do have exposed healthcare providers, they don't necessarily need to be uh, excluded from work provided that they remain asymptomatic. Next slide. So these are really great links that go into more detail on all of the topics that we have covered so far for you guys today. Um, the next slide has even more links and resources. And I think with that, we're ready to transition back to Dr. Bergman. Thank you, Dr. Darby and Paige. We really appreciate that. That was a very thorough and good uh, presentation. Uh, just a reminder to all, the presentation will be made available and these slides uh, can be made available upon request as well. Uh, so we'll make sure that folks have access to this. <laughs> I would like to uh, uh, transition now to our panel discussion, uh, and I'm going to introduce our panelists, um, and then uh, we will take questions both here uh, in the auditorium and as well online. You can use the Q&A function, the chat function, and we'll help uh, facilitate this. So uh, first person I'm going to introduce is Dr. Akira Shizido. He's an assistant professor of medicine here at VCU in the Infectious Disease Division. Uh, he received his medical degree from Harvard Medical School and trained in medicine at Walter Reed National Military Medical Center. After several years of practicing operational medicine in the Army with time spent in Honduras, Germany, Thailand, Kuwait, Iraq, Syria, and Afghanistan, he trained in infectious diseases at the University of Maryland Medical Center. Uh, he specializes in travel medicine, emerging infectious diseases, and biodefense. Welcome, Dr. Shizido. Next, Dr. Patricia Falco. Uh, she's a clinical pharmacist specialist in internal medicine and HIV care here at VCU in Richmond, Virginia. Her current practice consists of clinical pharmacy responsibilities and in HIV infectious disease clinic. Uh, she received her doctorate of pharmacy from West Virginia University School of Pharmacy and completed a pharmacy practice residency at the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center and Pharmacy Residency in Internal Medicine at Rush Presbyterian St. Luke's Medical Center in Chicago. Dr. Folka was recognized as a pharmacist of the year by the Virginia Society of Health System Pharmacists in 2004 and received the Outstanding Mentor Award and Preceptor of the Year Awards from the VCU School of Pharmacy in 2009 and 2014. She has been featured in the top 100 docs of Richmond Magazine and has received numerous teaching awards here in the Department of Internal Medicine. Uh, she was recently awarded uh, the Health Pharmacy Residency Preceptor Impact Award in 2014 and continues to practice here at the VCU Medical Center and holds dual appointments as a clinical professor of pharmacy at the School of Pharmacy and as an assistant professor of internal medicine within the Division of Infectious Diseases. Welcome, Dr. Falco. Uh, lastly, we have Dr. Gonzalo Behrman. Uh, he's the chair of the Division on Infectious Diseases and holds the Richard, Richard P. Wenzel Professor of Internal Medicine position and is a hospital epidemiologist here at the VCU Health System. He's a graduate of Colgate University, uh, SUNY of Buffalo School of Medicine and Biomedical Sciences and at Columbia, Columbia University for his MPH. He completed a residency in internal medicine and was chief resident both at SUNY at Buffalo. 
He then completed a fellowship in infectious diseases and residency in preventative medicine and public health, both at Cornell University. He's board certified in internal medicine, infectious diseases, and general preventative medicine and public health. Since 2005, Dr. Behrman has worked on the VCU Global Health Program through the Honduras Medical Relief Brigade, a medical relief effort bringing medical and public health assistance to rural Honduran communities. In 2013, Dr. Behrman launched a medical literary messenger as an online magazine for humanities and medicine, where he serves as the editor in chief. He serves as current section editor for current and infectious diseases reports and as an editor in chief of current treatment option in infectious diseases. From 2013 and 2015, Dr. Behrman was the chair of the Society of Healthcare Epidemiology of Virginia Guidelines Committee. Welcome, Dr. Behrman. Would like to invite our panelists to come up front um, and we will uh, begin to take some questions, uh, both uh, from Dr. Darby, Dr. Page, as well as our panelists. So there should be two microphones that we can rotate. Um, and I'm gonna try to switch the video. The, let's see here if I can get you guys on screen. Maybe it's not great. Show up great, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, like faces are uh, dark because of the background, but we'll see if we can get the technical detail sorted out. Thanks for your patience. So um, maybe we'll start with our uh, panelists. And if you each of you just want to give uh, maybe one or two comments uh, in your specialty, uh, maybe specific to uh, VCU uh, concerns, guidance for the general medical um, community, and we can start there, maybe that would be helpful. Dr. Shusido. Sure, so um, we've had a handful of patients with monkeypox so far at uh, VCU, uh, not a ton, fortunately, but um, uh, as, uh, as they mentioned, Dr. Bergman, I think you have to unmute yourself. Uh, so Sorry. I was just saying that, um, as you said- Sorry before, about that. We do have T-pox on site here at VCU. We have used it um, both in uh, IV and PO formulations mm -hmm. here. Uh, and the way that works is just consult ID, and we take care of all the paperwork. Um, so just consult ID, and we basically take care of the rest. Um, I was just going to say that no, no, please. Oh, Dr. Dr. Page said it um, through her discussion that there's 41% of the patients who have had concurrent HIV, and that was both in the MMWR from the U.S. as well as the recent report from the New England Journal on. 16 countries who reported 528 cases. Um, and so we don't really know a lot about picoviramat in drug drug interactions in these drugs. And so this is something we're evaluating. I have put together a um, drug drug interaction chart on the International Stewardship Program site um, for some guidance. And I would recommend if you have a patient who is considered to and you want to take the bottle to consult the infectious disease service for proper drug dosage. Yeah, I don't think this works. <laughs> yeah, sorry. We, just a, a quick thing. Are folks able to hear online? Um, we're having some technical audio issues. Uh, okay. Uh, maybe we'll ask our speakers if you guys want to come up the podium instead. I don't want your voice to go in and out. We have a microphone here. So um, you want to try it first and then... Um, sure. It doesn't seem like it's working very well. Okay. <laughs> Why don't you come up here and uh, the microphone here seems I'm, to pick I'm not sure things. what to add except uh, consult ID and we'll take care of things, something of that nature. And of course, gratitude, deep gratitude for Dr. Shishido and Dr. Foco for their work really behind the scenes to make this happen. Uh, and also really all members of the infectious diseases team have worked to really streamline our internal processes of getting the tick of your It's a lot more difficult than it would appear. So thank you. I'll give it to that. All right, uh, we'll start taking questions. Anybody from the audience here with comments? Um, they mentioned during the presentation that they're working on um, an easy way for friends to go here. I was curious if there's any more detail about that or timing or uh, if one will be preferred over the other, if you know any more detail about this thing. You want you may have to repeat the question. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's for them. Were you guys able to hear the question? No, probably not at all. Um, 
do you guys want, do you want to try a microphone? I can do you want to just repeat it? Okay. Yeah, there's questions about the Brensoviramab. Brensodopamine, sorry. Brensodopavir, uh, EUA. Yeah. Question is, any more details around that? So the Brensodopavir, they're the CDC is developing the protocol. So we don't have any information about when that medication should be initiated, what dose, um, for how long. So until that protocol is published, I don't, we don't have any treatment information. The other questions from the audience? Let me uh, repeat the question um, for the online folks. Dr. Syme was asking uh, where we've seen five patients at VCU. Where have they been seen? Um, emergency room or other clinical sites? So you guys want to? Yeah, so a, a couple have come in through the clinic, um, either just as direct referrals or even just kind of um, coming in for routine HIV care and then complaining of a rash or of pain somewhere and then testing positive for monkeypox. A couple have come through the ER as well. Um, and either already came in with the diagnosis of monkeypox through VDH and then got worse and then came into the ER uh, for pain or came in with something and were diagnosed in the ER. So basically ID clinic ER. Um, I know that there's been a couple tested from like OB clinic uh, and in the literature, um, it seems that most people seem to be presenting to, you know, either ID clinics, um, STD clinics, or but also uh, being seen in like OBGYN clinics too. Um, so just kind of a, to reiterate, like just kind of be vigilant about when someone's coming in for a rash or, or a lesion of any kind, like if you're in clinic, medicine clinic, any kind of clinic, that seems to be where a lot of these patients are actually being picked up along the way. May I add a quick clinical pearl to that? Sure. So we mentioned it being vigilant for rashes and lesions. Just understand that not all the lesions will look like the textbooks in the photos we were shown earlier. It's not uncommon for patients to have less than 20 lesions. The lesions can be in the mucous membranes and look in the mouth. They can be few, like less than five. Also, be aware of that prodrome of the fever uh, that goes along with that. And assess for lymphadenopathy. In the current case series, there's a significant amount of regional lymphadenopathy. So look for those kind of things. Have a low threshold if you see any of those symptoms. The fever, the antecedent to the rash, the rash, even if it's only a handful of vesicles or pustules, Think monkeypox or put that in the back of your mind and look for lymphadenopathy. Thank you. Great. Doc uh, yeah. Oh, yeah, please. Go ahead, Brandy. I was going to say there are, are a couple questions in the chat. Um, if it, now is a good time, it's just going to jump in. There was a question asking about lesions being at the same stage of development. Classically with monkeypox, we have thought of all lesions being at the same stage of development, regardless of where they're at in the body. Um, with this particular outbreak, we have seen lesions being at different stages of development on the same person. So I just wanted to make folks aware of that. Um, there was another question in here about how monkeypox lesions might differ from hand, foot, and mouth. And I didn't know if perhaps one of the other panelists might want to speak to that. Sure, I would say that um, just clinically looking at it, yeah, probably clinically indistinguishable, so just test for it. Um, I will say that, uh, you know, some people, hand, foot, mouth, like you'll get like desquamation of the hands afterwards and that so far I haven't really seen too much of that in the monkeypox patients that we've seen here. Um, but any, any lesion that's on the palms and soles right now uh, definitely should be suspicious for, for monkeypox and you should definitely test for that, so. And don't forget syphilis. And syphilis and Rocky Mountain spot fever measles. Yeah. <laughs> Doctor, go ahead. Sorry, Doctor Bergman. If I can just circle back to the Bryn Sidofavir question really quick, I just want to clarify. Sure. So, Bryn Sidofavir is FDA approved for the treatment of smallpox. So we have dosing information for the treatment of smallpox with Bryn Sidofavir, but we don't have treatment information for monkeypox. Brin Sidofavir is only available through the strategic national stockpile anyway, so that's not commercially available. So until we have that new protocol published by the CDC, we won't 
we most likely won't have access to brindisidofibir for monkeypox. But the the word on the street is that CDC is working on it. Okay, thank you. We have about 10 minutes left. I have a series of questions, but there's one more on the chat here uh, for pain. Can we use topical lidocaine or diclofenac or should we stick to oral preparations um, or should we just stick to oral preparations? I think, okay. Any comments, thoughts? That's a great question about the pain. I mean, these lesions are definitely excruciatingly painful. Um, we may be able to use lidocaine and topical diclofenac, but most of these patients probably on um, that significant degree are probably going to need opioids or narcotics um, for a temporary time period. Great. Uh, any other comments? Yes. Can you comment on how the oral uh, lesion might present if they are removed from like active ulcers or leukocytes, for example, if it's back to only the Sure, I'll repeat the question. Uh, the question was the uh, oral lesions, mucus lesions, uh, how they're distinguishable from aphids ulcers or uh, mucositis. Uh, so we'll see if folks have any guidance. Sure, I mean, so I, I will say in general, um, I have not seen this in writing anywhere, but um, if it's a truly ulcerative lesion, like an excavating kind of ulcerative lesion, uh, less likely to be monkeypox. The monkeypox lesions can look ulcerative when they get towards the end after they've gone through like the vesicular stage and they start to scab and, and kind of slough. But if it's truly like excavating like ulcerative lesion, it's potentially less likely to be monkeypox. Um, I think given like your patient's clinical context and, you know, exposure history, make a decision. But, uh, you know, depending on where they're coming from, I, I would have a very, again, very low threshold to test anyone with any kind of suspicious lesions for that. So, yeah, please. I would say that um, that there's an excellent review, uh, 528 cases in New England Journal. And if you go to the New England Journal website, the supplementary appendix, Chloe Orkin, who's the lead author, she's an HIV specialist at UK, there is a fantastic clinical image. A supplementary appendix that has different stages of lesions, multiple sites. It's a very great pictorial um, area for you to learn about the disease. Yes. Sure. I think the question, just to repeat for folks online, um, how long does it take for the lesions to resolve? Um, just a temporal guidance on lesions yeah it's, it's yeah i mean it so the classic smallpox teaching is like a month um usually around a month um we've had some patients that actually they their, their lesions have gone away like within about two weeks but usually it's about a month and it can be as long as six weeks for that okay Yes. Dr. Mulder, this is going back to your comment, and I just want to make sure I was absolutely clear. Um, patients who are on antiretroviral therapy will need those adjustment on the keep up, and they may. That's a great question, and the million dollar question that I've been really perseverating over. So, we know definitely that ticobiramat is an inhibitor of 2C8 and 2C19, but it is a, an inducer. And if you look at the label or some of the um, data online, is basically called a mild inducer of CYP3A4. However, if you look at some healthy volunteer studies where they use midazolam, which is a CYP3A4 substrate, midazolam levels were lowered by 50%. So I have brought a patient in. He came in on day 12 of ticoviramet and we drew Bictegravir levels. And so we're waiting on that data. And so my assessment is that, yes, you probably will need an adjustment or a change to a different antiretroviral regimen. Uh, we do know that things like Duraverine, brand name Pifeltro, Rilpivirine, brand name Durant, or it's in other combinations of Defsi, Complera, Juluca, that I would recommend doubling those doses, and we can do that readily. Um, sometimes I'm going to recommend switching the patient's meds altogether. So that's great information. I hope more to come once I get some of these drug levels back. Thank you. Let's see. I think we have one more question online. Um, does natural infection with monkeypox confer lifelong immunity, or are those patients still eligible for vaccination with Juneus if they meet vaccination criteria? Uh, 
who wants to take that question? I can speak to that a little okay. bit. So we do expect that there will be some degree of immunity that develops after natural infection, and that that will be protective for a period of time. Current guidance from CDC is that if a person, like say, for example, a person receives their first dose of the Janeos vaccine and then subsequently develops monkeypox infection, their recommendation is that that person does not need a second dose. We don't have any data that speaks, not that I'm aware of, that speaks to the long-term immunogenicity of natural monkeypox infection. So I think that's something that we're gonna need to wait and see how it plays out over time. Any other questions in the audience here? I don't know if uh, maybe a chair can speak to just how our handful of patients have gone, if they're far enough out in their follow up, even like, like were there any unexpected things that were particular for side effects? Okay, I think the question was how our handful of patients here at VCU have been doing. Yeah, so it, it's still early because it is a, a two week course, um, but uh, for the most part, like just anecdotally so far, people seem to have been doing well, um, whether that's the, the natural course of the disease or TPOX helped them. Uh, obviously, we don't know since we're, we don't have control subjects. Um, so far, only one patient, uh, we just submitted an SAE form who had an adverse event. I think it's frankly completely unrelated to the TPOX, but they ended up having to go back to the hospital uh, just for pain. Their, uh, their urethritis was so bad from the monkeypox that they ended up getting a Foley and having to go home with a Foley and it was, but so I don't think that had anything to do with the TPOX, but it just happened to happen after we initiated TPOX in that person, so, yeah. Dr. Morales, two patients that I can tell you who presented to clinic on um, day 14 viral loads, we repeated them just because of our consideration for their antiretrovirals and those, both those viral loads have been undetectable. The patient I brought in for drug levels day 12, he was pretty much scabbed over we were wondering whether or not we should bring him in, but he, his, all of his lesions were pretty much scabbed over at day 12. Uh, we have one person who raised their hand, uh, Bill Nelson. Uh, if you wanna go ahead and ask your question, you should be able to unmute yourself now. Okay, uh, feel free to just chat in the box if you have a particular question. Um, we have probably one more question if anybody in the audience has anything. Uh, Sure. Sorry, if you want to repeat the question. Yeah, so the question is why there's uh, there's been transmission, community transmission in North America and Europe and in other continents is not your typical endemic disease. Uh, well, first, I would say I, I wouldn't anticipate the transmission to uh, be as widespread as you see with other or other uh, pathogens in which you have a significant endemic zoonotic population. We don't have that yet in the United States. We have a veterinarian with us here, so she can clarify that for me. Uh, so we don't have that zoonotic pool here that we should have elsewhere. But I, I suspect that you have a combination of, of factors, which is a novel pathogen to most of us with waning immunity, many people not no longer vaccinated to smallpox and the right conditions, close contact and international travel. And that's how we've gotten monkeypox to where we are now. But I don't expect it to be endemic in the United States we have a veterinarian who can give us better uh, background on that since it's not part of the typical zoonotic uh, pool pathogens that we have. Um, so I, I would leave it at that. The other thing I would add is we didn't mention R0. Or the, we've heard that a lot over COVID-19. The classic uh, infectious disease with the massive R0 is measles with an R0 of 18 to 20, as high as 25. Not really sure what the R0 is for this. I've read it in one or two uh, papers that's maybe 1.5 to 2, so it's pretty small. So that would suggest, again, you, have, you don't have massive propagation properties of this particular virus or pathogen, so you shouldn't expect, expect with that massive explosions of infections across the population. Remember, R0, or I should first say epidemiology is not in the physical science, it's not an exact science, not physics, for example. 
So R0 is really a bit relative. It all depends on many conditions. Uh, and that's not just the transmissibility of, vi of the virus, but also people's behaviors and habits. So a long-winded answer. All right, thank you. And just to kind of piggyback off of that, I will say that we've been doing, you know, looking at the animal aspects of this from a couple of different points of view. Um, Virginia has invited CDC to come to the state twice now to deploy and test companion animals who've been in close contact with human cases. Um, and then also, I know that CDC is deployed to New York and they're doing testing of some of the uh, rodents and small urban wildlife around New York City. So we're proactively looking because there is potential that we could have a natural reservoir established in US wildlife and we do not want that. And so, <coughs> excuse me, just one thing, you know, I'll give a plug here for those of you who are interacting and talking with and providing care for patients. I think it is good to just make them aware, ask if there are pets in the household. We do ask that those with monkeypox uh, limit their interactions with any mammalian animals. So if they've got dogs, cats, livestock, you know, uh, limit those animal interactions. And if they must interact with their animals, we ask that they wear a mask and cover lesions while doing so. And we have some additional fact sheets about monkeypox and animals on our website. Thank you. Um, that is, it is at the top of the hour. Uh, this concludes the VCU Department of Internal Medicine Grand Round. So I want to thank all of our in-person participants and online. Um, also want to thank our speakers, uh, Dr. Page, Dr. Darby from VDH. Thank you for preparing a wonderful presentation and helping facilitate and sharing your knowledge. Uh, we appreciate that. Dr. Shazito, Dr. Falco, Dr. Behrman, thank you for being panelists and helping field some questions. I'm sure that uh, our panelists for the in-person folks here, if you have any questions or you wanna come down and ask anything else, uh, feel free to do so. Uh, for the online portion, we will have the uh, attendance uh, code up in a few minutes. Thank you all so much. We'll see you next week. <laughs>